Good morning or good afternoon or good evening whenever you're watching this online. Welcome to, today, to today's our virtual bridge session, which we have been running for quite some time now in uh, cooperation with CDN and JISC. Today we are delighted to be able to have Fiona Grant from West Highland College, who is going to talk to us on the subject of Not I, Conventional to Convert. This seems especially timely given the traumatic experience that many of, many of us have felt as we've been removed from our classrooms and our uh, usual personal comfort zones. So um, can traditional and digital be compatible and complementary in learning and teaching? Question mark. Fiona, over to you. Okay, thank you very much Owen for the very kind introduction. And um, I think I've got Kenji to thank for this because I originally contacted Kenji um, about um, maybe getting one of my colleagues to come and talk about um, online classroom delivery at West Highland College. It's something that we've been doing for a number of years, which I'll come to in a second. Um, and I believe um, Ben might be presenting on Friday um, to do with Google Hangouts and Google Classroom. So that would be worth having a look at. Um, so I'm going to share my screen just now. I can see everybody um, on the screen, um, but this will probably block a few of you out, so I won't be able to see you so well. I'm just going to get the screen up and share this. And um, I'm going to take you through uh, a number of sh uh, slides and um, I'll be dotting around a bit, so um, please bear with me. And um, really want to thank you Kenji for inviting me, I think this is an opportunity um, to share with you a bit of a story but at the same time this, this um, story of mine uh, draws parallels um, to the current situation which really we're technically in a, in, in a bit of a crisis and I, I believe that sometimes crisis can bring about and create an opportunity for change and um, something happened to me last, last year um, I had a very traditional viewpoint on things and uh, something happened to me uh, that kind of forced me into that sort of change thinking and um, really sort of coming at things from a different perspective. So I basically ended up shifting the way I did things um, because of this situation. And I think we're in a situation just now that gives us opportunity to do that and really think so um, hopefully you'll come away from this um, with um, some questions, maybe some new perspectives on things, and really you might not um, agree with everything I say, and that doesn't matter either. So I think it's first really good to have a think about where am I um, in, in the world, and I'm up in the, the west of Scotland. The University of the Highlands and Islands, I've got two maps here. Um, the University of the Highlands and Islands, UHI, is on the right hand side and you can see all the little dots that cover the whole of the UHI. It covers an area the size of Belgium. And then West Highland College is the map on the left hand side there. And uh, we have 10 centres, so we're almost like a mini UHI. And, um, we cover the, an, an area approximately half the size of Wales. There's about 40,000 people and um, about 20,000 of those people live in and around Fort William. So we're a very distributed college. Uh, we have 10 centres, but we have also very rural locations. And when we came into being 10 years ago, um, that's when the college was created. We had to think quite differently about the way we delivered things because our mission was to get learning out into the whole of the West Highlands. So on the back of UHI and their model for delivery, um, delivering HE, higher education, HMDs and degrees and above, we decided to use that model for our FE delivery and uh, we deliver full-time further education courses across our 10 centres, using the same technologies largely as the UHI does. We, we do the same for our school link program. Some of our schools are very small with less than 200 pupils. So you can imagine 
um, for them to have a choice of curriculum, the college is a good partner for that. So we deliver into our schools using Google Hangout and Google Classroom now, but we use the technologies as a way of delivering learning and teaching. So that's part of um, what this story is about. So, as I said, I work full time um, for the college and I am also a student and my area of interest is digital pedagogy. And I am also a cyclist. Um, and this is really part of my, um, my story. Why am I a cyclist? Because I love the social aspect of cycling and I love the outdoors. And I think those two things um, really got me into cycling. This is a, a small group of cyclists. Um, I got a group going in Kalakan. You can see the Sky Bridge, which is a good picture for today's bridge session. Um, a, and we got this group together, which really encouraged more females into cycling. And um, that um, got going last year, actually, um, at the beginning of the year. So um, cycling, I, I, as I said, I'm quite an avid cyclist. Um, and um, I, would, I would call myself more of an endurance cyclist, but I don't do as much of that just now because I just simply can't fit it all in. I love a sense of adventure. And um, actually, in 2016, I cycled around the whole of the, uni uh, the university. Uh, I joined all those dots up and I used my two wheels and Calmac Ferries and Northern Ferries line. It was absolutely fantastic to get around, meet my colleagues in person, because it really got me to understand the diversity of the university by doing that. As I said, I have many friends um, and we do a lot of cycling together. They're both male and female. My male friends um, seem to disappear in the winter time. Now, I talked about being a traditionalist and a conventionalist. I believe you cycle outside. But in the winter time, all my male friends seem to go indoors and in into hibernation. But they weren't really. They were doing all their training on a turbo inside. And they were quite frequently talking to me about, oh, you must do, um, you must get indoors for you. And I was saying, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's outdoors. You're not real cyclists if you're not outdoors. So anyway, we had a lot of these conversations. Um, I, I'm quite a strong cyclist. And I guess my best um, result was really in 2018 when I managed to cycle um, on a, one of the support sportives and come first female. And that was the one for me, it's a close one to me. It's the Apple Cross Run, it's about 90 miles and a lot of ascent and over that famous hill to Apple Cross. And then last year, um, I surprised myself, um, really. I won a bottle of whiskey, which was a real bonus, but got on the podium at the Inverness, um, so the Loch Ness Etap, um, and I was second female there and really, um, you know, a lot of my friends were saying, oh my goodness, it's great, we've got a sky rider on the podium. I, I don't know if I'll ever manage to do that again. I've got age against me, but no, that was quite a feat. But this Swift thing kept on coming up to me um, uh, with my friends saying, oh, you must try this Swift. And, you know, I was kind of poo-pooing it a lot of the time. And even down to the point, I, I was so opinionated and very much stuck in that sort of paradigm um, of having a way of doing things and sticking only to that way of doing things. And when I went to Halfords and Inverness one day and a really nice young chap helped me out with my bike and something, and he was talking about Swift. So I got on my hobby horse again, only to just discover that he was on his way to the first ever televised finalist of e-bikes. And we'll see e-racing coming up more and more now. Um, and he came third or fourth um, out of thousands of cyclists across the world. Um, and he went to London and was filmed doing that. Um, and actually, he's a really good outdoor cyclist and, and he wins races there as well. So um, I kind of learned my lesson a little bit by, um, by that. Um, but um, then last year, um, and this just gives you an image of um, what Swift actually kind of looks like, which I didn't know about at the time. But last year, um, round about the 10th of June, no, it was the 10th of June, sorry, um, something happened and bang, 
I'd been knocked off my bike by a car at around about 50 miles an hour who came from behind. And um, unfortunately, um, that put me in hospital for a few nights, um, but that wiped out my whole summer. I, I, I couldn't, you know, actually get, get out um, onto my bike. So my friend who'd kept on going at me said, look, you know, you really ought to give um, a, a turbo a try. It's, it's a safe way to get back on your bike and get that sort of confidence going. I did go outdoors on, on my mountain bike, but it actually quite hurt me because the, the, the road, you get quite a lot of vibration through the road. Um, so in autumn time, I bought a second hand um, turbo. A friend lent me um, his son's bike because his son had grown out of his bike and it fit me per perfectly and I set myself up. And then I entered into the world of gaming on a bicycle. And this is where I sort of started to kind of think about, well, wow, this, this, it really transformed what I had actually believed before until you actually experience something. And there are a lot of parallels I kind of draw from this in terms of learning and being a, a, a natural student as well and in the job that I'm, I'm in. So um, this gives you an indication of what the world actually looks like. And according to my son, who is an avid gamer, he says, oh, the graphics, mum. They're, they're rubbish, you know, that that's nothing. But it's not about that, it's about the community. It's about a sense of identity with a, a, a community. And I'll come to that in a, in, in a second as well. So you can move into different actual virtual worlds. This is New York. The previous one is one of those weird virtual worlds and they call it, oh, I can't remember, Wahoo or something like that. So, um, and you, you have everything actually on your screen. So um, what is the community like? So the Zwift online community is very much giving me a whole range of different things. So from a flexible point of view, I can choose when I want to go in Zwift, when I ride, at what time of the day, I can choose when I want to create a meetup with my outdoor friends or my new friends that I've met in this community. There's the whole social dimension that works particularly well for me, but I know friends who don't bother with the social side of things, although they quite like getting the kudos. So when I'm talking about kudos, you see the thumbs up sign there, you can give a thumbs up, a ride on to people that you're riding with at the same time. I'm, I'm the person in the blue there, that's my avatar. So from a social point of view, it really works for me. And, um, and from a flexible point of view, it works for me. If you are training hard for races, then you have timetabled activity and timetabled time where you need to join certain groups. And obviously, if you want to win a race, you need to go to that particular race and event. So you have races, you have training rides, you have social events as well. So you can actually join a social run on a Sunday and they name these things um, in different ways. But then on the other side is why am I so motivated? Why am I so um, you know, wanting to get back in there again? Because I get rewarded, I get badges, I get rewarded for what I do personally and I also have, um, you know, I can set goals for myself or Zwift actually sets goals for me and targets. And you move up preset levels and you move up them by sim simply taking part, doing different runs, um, doing hill climbs and distance. Um, you also get rewarded for uh, th uh, things that I thought to start with was a bit silly, but but I can understand that, that creates that sort of sense of community to, to, to engage with other people. So you're giving kudos or giving a thumbs up to other people. Um, you're doing a training ride, so you're improving yourself. So your performance starts to actually improve, and I did see that on myself. But there's the whole community of support, advice and help that's there that is part of Zwift and there are actual experts in there at the same time as you get that advice and support from your peers that you're riding with. 
And I think um, um, here on the right hand side of the screen, you can see you can actually text and chat when you're actually on a ride together. I find that really hard because uh, I've got to breathe hard. Um, and at the same time, at the top of the screen here, you can see I've got my distance, what distance I've already done, what um, the wattage, what your output is. And also uh, you've got your elevation. I've already done, climbed 128 meters. Um, and I'm sitting at the moment at 34 miles per hour, uh, kilometers per hour, excuse me. At the bottom of the screen, you've got a whole range of different things that you can actually do. You can give a thumbs up, you can wave to people, you've got your cadence, whole range of tools just to look at your performance. So I think there are some interesting parallels, as I said, and I, I think um, for me, why is Zwift so effective at engaging people? And I, I actually believe it's about that community and it's about that sense of belonging. Um, and um, it's interesting that my friends were so, uh, you know, really at me before to say, come on, you've just got to give it a go. And I was so resistant because I was just, just didn't want to go there at all. But I was actually forced into doing this um, because of the situation that happened to me. I think there are some parallels and some relevant theory, um, like there, there are with, with, with lots of things that are relevant to um, this particular system. Um, and even going back and thinking about, um, you know, the psychologist, philosopher, Jane, uh, William James, and how the identity theory and that sort of community and sense of belonging um, even comes into play. But I've chosen a couple. Um, here, Vygotsky, the Russian psychologist, and I think that's that for me when I think about Zwift and also in learning. Um, so the support, the advice and the expert, that very much links to Vygotsky's um, a theory. And so you're engaging with others, with your peers, and it's that social interaction, I think, that's really, really important. And important in learning as well. And then the other theory that really sprang to mind and is the community of inquiry. And there's a lot out there about community of inquiry, particularly in the HE world. But I think this is highly relevant and really important for people to consider um, when we're, we're talking about trying to create that sort of community of learning now that people are even more socially distanced than ever before. And um, one of my colleagues um, from Inverness College, I think, was speaking earlier um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Alice, a, uh, she was talking about the human side of learning and how important it is to be, have that human presence. And I think that is very much um, true as well. So there's a lot you can find online about uh, the Garrison Anderson and Archer's um, model. And I think it is highly relevant. So what I've done is I've sort of transposed the Zwift community into the way I see how this it just kind of fits and mirrors very much with the way we're thinking about an online student community. And I don't see an online student community being anything other than just another dimension to a physical campus, um, whether you're coming in to learn and learn in a construction um, workroom and some of your um, time will be in a sort of physical classroom or indeed some of your time might be in an online classroom and then it's about also providing um, flexible learning time but I think that needs to be very much scaffolded and directed um, so that helps particularly our FE students you've still got this learning to do in this particular week, but this is a little bit of direction in and around that. And then of course, our guidance staff and our teaching staff are there on the side at all times to support and advise and to help students. Um, but I think by finding a way in and around setting goals, setting targets, finding ways of rewarding students and keeping them motivated, you can provide a really good 
experience. And at the end of the day, this is about good learning and teaching and finding a space where students can come and, and get that real experience. And I think in today, what, what we, we've got coming up um, and coming back to college, I think there's an awful lot of questions there um, that I would be you know, chatting to our own staff about. So coming back to the point at the beginning, um, traditional and digital, compatible and complementary. Yes, I believe it can be. And there's a really good example of that. I like reading books, but I'm quite equally happy to read a book on a digital device or a, 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 an article on a digital device. And in fact, the digital just provides an easier way to sometimes find information. So what is possible? And these are questions I just think would be good to put out there. Um, how do we need to design our learning and teaching? What is the pedagogy? I forgot to put that up here, sorry. Pedagogy is really important. Um, what about the spaces for learning? And, and spaces can be online spaces as well as physical spaces. And then time for learning is really, really important in all of this. Um, I think what we found is that it has been very difficult to find um, or even connect to some of the online classrooms because we're also busy trying to school our, uh, our children at home. So perhaps the timetable of actual classroom delivery does not need to look or feel the same as it has done in the past. And I know we have always been kind of, oh, it's got to be 18 hours a week of um, learning together in a classroom. But why does it have to be? And how does that fit with a carer or somebody who's got a part time job? So I think there's a mixture of both and they're both equally valid. You do need the practical experience. We do need our students to climb the hill and experience the climbing of the hill. But at the same time, it's a balance about looking about flexible learning and um, that side of things. For me as well, the community and the social and the inclusion and the inclusion is an interesting one and it's something I think um, another one of my colleagues, Professor Keith Smythe, um, he recently created a, a, a video, um, a reflection, some thoughts, some hopes um, it, um, instead of the solstice um, 2020 conference and he was talking very much about how many people might not have access um, to uh, a space for learning nor have the actual uh, connectivity and I know in the West Highlands and in the Highlands there are issues with that but there are also workarounds that we can think about. So really, those are my um, thoughts and um, I, I hope this has helped you um, have a, maybe draw some conclusions or even have questions. I think questions are really important and um, so are conversations and I think that's what we need to continue to have. So I just want to say thank you very much and um, I can stop sharing this, the screen and take any questions and have questions yourself and answer them yourselves. Thank you so much, Fiona, that was wonderful. Um, just in terms of the mechanics, um, so you're sitting there in a, you know, a room of your house peddling and that then you know, gets sent over the internet and it competes with other people, yeah? Yes. So in terms of, uh, I'm perhaps very cynical, if there's a tournament mode, how do you make sure people aren't cheating? Sorry? If there's a tournament mode, how do you make sure that people aren't cheating? They haven't got, you know, they're just, you know, get no resistance on their pedals. How does that work? It, it, um, the whole bicycle takes over. So you're, it's all Bluetoothed in. So the actual turbo machine that you're sitting on um, relates to the terrain that you're running over or you're um, cycling over. So, so as soon as you start hitting a hill, you know about it mm -hmm. and, and you have to work your gears according to the terrain that you're on. So that, I mean, I think, I believe the, the have, um, there has been um, in some races, um, 
that there are, you, you can actually use a button as well to give you um, aerodynamics. <clears throat> so say when you, you're out on the ro road and you're cycling, you, you cycle behind people to get um, the benefit of a little yeah. bit of a break. Same is in um, that Zwift world. You you get a, a thing telling you you're um, five meters away, three meters away, two meters, one meter, one meter. It starts to feel a little bit easier. So it simulates everything for you at the same time. Oh, that's wonderful. And so away from the mechanics, and you were talking about community and rules, norms. I'm just thinking in terms of moderation that happens within that group and how we can take that into our learning. Is there a set amount of rules where you get banned if you're acting like a troll and being abusive, or is that self-policed by the community? How does that work? I think it's it's about it's it's about the community. Um, it just doesn't seem to happen, and I've never seen it actually. Everybody encourages everybody else, and there's mm. a lot of chit chat going on. Um, as I said, I don't I don't do so much of that because I can't. <laughs> I'm too busy cycling. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's self-regulated almost. It's that community. It's a bit like um, you do sign up to something when you sign up to Swift. Um, so you read through everything that you're, you're signing up to. Um, it's mm -hmm. a bit like that sort of when you start off at the beginning of the year with a no new cohort of students. You agree with your, your uh, students, the set of behaviours, if you like, um, yeah. and um, you know, they come into um, play with that. So I think it's very similar to that. Um, if, if you were being abusive, I've never seen that, but if you were being abusive, I'm sure that would be, um, you subscribe to it as well. You pay a small amount per month. Okay, so that they do have your personal details and all the rest of it. So uh, yeah, uh, and I think if you're investing so much in it, you're unlikely to spend all your time trolling, I think, unlike you know, someone just sitting in a casual game at home. So I uh, can open up. Anyone else with any questions for Fiona here? Kenji? Yeah. Uh, Fiona, I was really interested in what you were saying. I've never encountered Zwift. The nearest thing that, that I can think of, um, that I know of, but never actually experienced was at the Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. They actually have a virtual rig simulator. So it, it's a room you go in and if you're training um, for oil rig drilling, it actually simulates that experience. So I would imagine that it's quite similar, um, but it's very much got a very kind of technical academic feel to it. But I was really interested, Fiona, in, in how you think you can apply that kind of Zwift model to the learning experience at West Highland College. Yeah, um, it's it's interesting. We're going through um, a bit of a change again. Um, it's about getting um, people to start thinking differently, particularly in and around. I think we're we're quite wedded to doing things in a certain way in terms of um, the timetable is one, and um, I think there is room now for all colleges. Um, to think quite carefully about um, when learning takes place and the different spaces. So you have spaces where you're getting groups of people together with the lecturer, um, but then you've also got to create that sort of space for learners to learn independently, albeit um, perhaps directed. So by next week, we need everybody to have maybe worked in groups to do something, watch a video. So it's that, it's bringing about that flipped learning. So um, flip, yeah, I would say the flipped classroom. And it's, it's about persuading and encouraging people that actually it's still teaching. It's still teaching time. Um, you, you may be teaching instead of 18 hours a week, um, you're reducing that to 12 hours of classroom activity because we've got to now fit students into a construction classroom where we used to have 14, that's now reduced to seven. Um, so we're going to have to move people about. But what about the rest of the time? Um, what theory can they be learning and how is that going to be directed each week? 
but giving them the choice as to when they do it. So that's one way of looking at things. But I think, again, we've got to get people on board and staff on board and teaching staff on board as to the fact that this still requires teaching, still requires a little bit of structure. I think we all need structure around our, our especially just now around our chaotic lives. Thank you, Fiona. So thanks, Kenji. I saw that you said you had a question. Um, just, just a very quick question. So I, I really like this idea as to how, how, how can we look at this example and how does it apply to, to learning and teaching? So various really interesting aspects to it. One that I wanted to focus on is there's a lot of feedback to the student around the data about how they're performing, how well they're doing, uh, where they need to get to to reach the next stage. Um, so that, that plays into the, the amount of data that we should be giving to students potentially. But one important aspect of the gamification which you kind of talk about in, in this context, is there is a strong element of competition in, in this example. And I wonder, do you think competition has a place in learning and teaching in a college university context? And, and if there are some difficulties with that, do you have any ideas about how we could take advantage of competition, but not disadvantage the students that we, we work with? I think um, there is a place for that. I think it's something that we have to be quite careful about. Um, I think most people, a lot of people, I was the same, oh no, I'm not competitive at all, but I am, I know I am now, everybody says I am. I, but the people naturally want to improve and want to um, see themselves getting a little bit better. And there is an element, there is a strong element of competition there. But equally, I have a lot of um, female cyclists, more so than male cyclists, that aren't so bothered about that. They're the ones that will give you a pat on the back to say, um, you know, well done, you've done really well. There's another uh, queen of the mountains, they're called, um, in, 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 the, in the world of cycling. Um, so I think it has to be very careful. But one of the things with Swift. I think that's really good and it's in other um, sort of uh, social media um, Strava you may have heard about so Strava um, you can you can record all your rides outside and um, you've got you know where you've been and everything it's about your personal record it, and and that's what comes up I nobody else sees that um, it's the fact that this time I've been on and I've beaten my last time. So this time I've done this piece of learning a little bit better than I did it the last time. And when you think about some of the sort of more automated learning um, that you have um, when you're, you're working through sort of like a test, I'm just thinking of something like ECDL, for example, you're doing your word tests, you're doing your practices, you get that immediate feedback to say, okay, you've, um, you've got 65%. These are the areas that, that ha haven't worked quite so well. So, and then the next time it comes up, you've done that a bit better. Um, so if there's a way of sort of giving you that reward, that little sort of um, thing to say, well done, you've done that better, that's that bit completed. But I think it has to be very careful because not everybody um, you might end up with some students that are disadvantaged um, because of um, somebody will always be at the front. There will always be somebody out there running the race. Um, and I'm thinking back to primary school days. We, we used to have a lot of sport at, in primary school. And nowadays, or certainly when my son went through um, primary school, the element of competition was, was brought away. And I think that, that, that is a shame because um, some students respond particularly well to um, competition and doing better and being seen to have done better. So it, I think it's a fine balance and I think we need to work on that. Okay, excellent. So we're getting near the end of the limit of the YouTube recorded video part of this. So we will bring the formal proceedings to a close. We'll say goodbye to everyone online just now. So goodbye and thank you for joining Virtual Bridge.